Welcome back to our lecture on hypothesis testing for single samples. So let's pick up where we left off with our Z distribution example on how to find a sample size. We were discussing how easy it was to find a sample size using a Z score. Now let's move on to the difference between our T statistic. With the T value, however, it's a little different. So the T distribution formulas for type 2 errors have been integrated numerically, so there's not really a well-defined method for determining beta. So there's not really a well-defined method for determining beta with the T distribution. With the Z distribution, we have formulas, but for the T distribution, it's a little different. So the probability of beta then can be characterized or estimated using operating characteristic curves. So these curves then are in your book in Appendix A in Chart 7. So the operating characteristic curves for two-sided tests for the t-distribution are shown in Appendix A, Chart 7, E and F. For one-sided tests, they're in charts G and H. So keep in mind you have to pay attention, okay? So these are going to be based on your t-distribution and a one-sided or two-sided test and a level of alpha. So your operating characteristic curve for a one and two-sided Z distribution then are shown in chart seven A through D. So as you use these, really pay attention to which ones you're using. So basically these curves are generated through a lot of testing and sampling for different values of the variance which is not known. Okay, so these charts can be kind of hard to understand how to use. There's an example in your book on how to do it. I'm gonna do a different example here. So given that a sample mean is 22.5, what sample size would be required to detect a true mean as high as 22.75 if we wanted the power of the test to be at least 0.9? Use the sample standard deviation of 0.378 as an estimate of sigma and a significance level of 0.05. So before we can actually go to the values and extract some sample size, we need to be able to solve for the values it asks for. So first of all, on the x-axis of my operating characteristic curve, there's something called D. And D is this formula where I have delta over sigma, meaning the difference in my means over sigma. So I'm gonna say if I have a sample mean of 22.5, and I want it to detect a mean as high as 22.75, I calculate that difference over 0.378 and I get 0.66. Then I'm gonna say alpha is 0.05. So in your book, this would be on chart E, well, chart seven, version E, given that alpha equals 0.05 and it's a two-sided test. So I then go to my curve. This graph that I have, you can tell is from an older version of a book, so it says chart A, but really we're looking at chart E. So the first thing you should do is confirm that you're on the right chart. So this is for a two-sided t-test with a level of significance of alpha equals 0.05. And then I come here to look for D. This is D, so with D, I calculated that to be 0.66. So somewhere along here, so notice this is zero, this line is 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, et cetera. So I'm gonna say about right here is gonna be 0 0.66. So then I know that my y-axis is beta, or one minus power. So then I come here and I find beta equaling 0 0.1, or about halfway between here and here. So where those two intersect is gonna be along this curve right here. So these different curves are my different sample sizes, or as you can notice, n equals two, three, four, et cetera. So if you lie between two sample sizes, you would estimate in between them, but here, or usually, you'll run into a line. So I'm gonna say I need a sample size of 30 in order to get a power of 0.9. So that's how to use these curves. Okay, so now the question, why do we go through all of this work? Why do we use that one Z distribution formula? Why do we use the operating characteristic curves? Why don't we just go out and sample like 100 people every single time? So there's a few reasons. So first of all, a large sample size is more representative of a population. And we know this based on the central limit theorem that the more people we actually survey, right, or poll, the more accurate our information will be. So it's also necessary to produce results among variables that are significantly different, okay? So if we want to notice a difference, if there actually is one, we need to sample a lot of people. 
So when the goal is to reduce the chances of discovery failure, a large sample size broadens the range of possible data and helps us form a better picture for analysis. So a sample size is a big deal. And I feel like as a statistician, or as you guys move forward from this class, it's something you're going to take with you and help you be a little more, I don't want to say skeptical, because that has a negative connotation. Maybe just look into things a little bit more before you believe them. So I can remember driving home from a class I was teaching last summer, and I heard on the radio that home births in the United States had a 20% increase in fatality for either the child or the mother in the last year. That's a huge deal. 20% of either children or mothers were dying during delivery in home births versus hospitals. So it was 20% increase over just one year. So I went home because I wanted to read the article and as I read the article I read the little asterisk at the bottom of the page that said that it was based on a sample of five. Five people in Montana in one city, that's it, were pulled and one of those babies died. So if you think about it, that is a ridiculous sample size, both in number and in the demographic and location, to go on the radio and extrapolate saying that that same thing, that same event for five people in Montana, and it's going to happen for every single baby in the United States, period, over the next year. It's just kind of silly if you think about it. So just make sure as you're reading articles or studying up on things, you pay attention to what the actual sample size is. So, I really like this quote. It's an important economic and ethical reason for having a specific sample size. This professor from University of Iowa says, an undersized study can be a waste of resources for not having the capability to produce useful results, while an oversized one uses more resources than are necessary. In an experiment involving human or animal subjects, sample size is a pivotal issue for ethical reasons. An undersized experiment exposes subjects to potentially harmful treatments without advancing knowledge. In an oversized experiment, an unnecessary number of subjects are exposed to potentially harmful treatment or are denied a beneficial one. So like this quote says, if we take too few samples, it's not representative, right? If we want to know, if we want to go pull the country and find out who people are leaning toward for president, if I just go pull 50 of my neighbors, that's not going to be accurate. I would need to pull hundreds of thousands of people in different states and different counties to get an accurate representation. But like this also says, an oversized experiment can also sometimes not be a great idea because that can be unethical or expose people to things that they don't really need to be exposed to. Okay, so I have a funny video clip that also helps us think of this idea. Ladies, I offer myself up to you and your cause. What's this? I took it upon myself to pull the town, and I think you're going to be pretty happy with the results. We are? Jackson is solidly in the lead. Already? We just started bugging people. Well, I modeled my poll after the Gallup poll. The Gallup poll uses a sample of 1,005 voters to represent the 280 million people of the United States. Using that logic, the correct sampling size of the town of Stars Hollow would be .002. Rounding that up means one person needs to be pulled, so I picked me. You pulled yourself. I was right there. Seemed like a perfect opportunity. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for dressing up to talk to yourself. And secondly, I think you're going to need to pull a few more people to get a better sense of where we really are. Oh. Okay, I'll see what I can do. Thanks, Kirk.